so hi everyone uh, welcome to our wednesday seminar so today's speaker is uh, dr uh, rhodes uh, dr uh, lauren rhodes and it's a great pleasure um, to introduce her uh, for a couple of reasons well first of all she's really a brilliant uh, scientist so she's currently a post uh, postdoctoral uh, fellow uh, at the university of oxford um, so she's uh, an expert specializing in radio transients, uh, gamma ray bursts, and, um, and pulsars as well. Uh, so she uh, recently graduated from Oxford as well um, uh, for her PhD. And uh, Lauren and I met in Bonn, where she spent a year of her PhD uh, working on, on pulsars. And um, Lauren is working with uh, really the largest radio telescopes uh, on Earth. On, uh, and she's trying to understand the high energy emission and the associated uh, multi-wavelength emission coming from high energy phenomena. So GRBs and uh, X-ray bursts and their jets and also uh, things like uh, double neutron star mergers and, and pulsars. So today she's going to talk about uh, some of this uh, afterglows that, uh, of very high energy gamma ray bursts that she has been uh, studying with uh, um, uh, this telescope. So, Lauren, th thanks again for uh, accepting our invitation, and um, the floor is yours. Cool. Okay. Well, firstly, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is the first talk I've given since I got my uh, PhD earlier this year, so this is also very exciting for me. Um, I uh, So, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you guys about... Um, oh, uh, well, the title of my talk is Synchrotron Afterglows of VHE GLBs. Um, now, already there's two acronyms in there. It wouldn't be an astronomy talk, I don't think, if I didn't have acronyms. Um, so, and I will use these throughout my talk. Otherwise, it just, it like literally doubles the length of everything I have to say. Um, so the first acronym, VHE, stands for very high energy. Uh, and this is an energy re regime that is above 100 GeV. Um, so 100 giga electron volts. So this is very, very high energy compared to radio, what I usually study. Um, and then the second uh, acronym is GLB. Now this stands for gamma ray burst. And I will talk about these two, um, all the components in my title separately, um, and then bring it all together at the end. Um, and yeah, so if at any point you guys have any questions, can you please like say it out loud? because I can't see the chat at the top of my screen, I've just realized. Um, and yeah, but, and then a final note is, uh, obviously the work I've done here today that I'm showing you guys is not work that I've done on my own. Um, it is part of, uh, it is the amalgamation of many years of uh, theory and building uh, up our understanding of these observations and how to interpret them. Um, and it's but it's not just established collaborations that I've become a part of in when I started my PhD. Um, it's also this work has enabled a lot of new collaborations to have started. Um, and that's been actually really, really nice to see how um, people from different fields can come together and work on a single object, which has been uh, one of my favorite parts of this whole process. So um, just a quick rundown of like the structure of my talk. Um, so first I'll give you guys an introduction into what gamma ray bursts or GLBs are, um, and then go on to what the very high energy counterpart should look like to these events. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, two particular VHE GLBs in, uh, that I've published on over the past two, three years. Um, and then go on to looking at population studies of these uh, events, and then what... Uh, as we're starting to consider these events as a population, what we really need to do looking forward um, to the future of this field. Um, and then I'll give a very, very quick overview of what's going on with the latest VHE GLB, uh, which is GLB 221009A. Um, so let's get started. Um, so GLBs, uh, are we observe them as bright flashes of gamma rays that last hundreds of milliseconds to hundreds of seconds. Um, and we detect them with uh, space-based satellites, uh, telescopes such as Fermi or Swift. Um, but this isn't, a, these are very new uh, instruments. Um, actually the first time we were able to detect GRBs was back in the 1970s uh, after the launch of the Vela satellites. Um, and 
it became pretty clear uh, that these were isotropically distributed across the sky, um, which either indicated they were very, very nearby, almost within our own solar system, or very, very far away. Uh, we now know that they are very, very far away. Um, and they are so, they are some of the most luminous events that we know of, these bright flashes of X ray and gamma rays. In some cases, we can actually detect these events out to redshifts of eight or nine. Um, so they're actually not just good for studying what these individual events are, but understanding how the uh, processes that enable these events to happen, how they change over cosmic time. So it's not just, I'm not just interested in for like a particular reason in understanding the VHE component. There's so many different ways that you can study these events and understand how um, really uh, there's a whole global picture that's going on here with these. Um, oh, is it gonna change slide? Yeah. Um, so the gamma ray burst part, the flash, um, that I've just mentioned, uh, how is that produced? So the ones that I'm interested in are called long gamma ray bursts. So these uh, are flashes that last upwards of two seconds. And we believe that these are created when a massive star, i.e. a wolf ray at star, so it's very massive but quite compact and it's rapidly rotating, um, as I have on my uh, nice picture on the left-hand side here, um, it reaches the end of its lifetime and undergoes core collapse. Now, in the center of that massive star, we think that a compact object, i.e. a massive neutron star or a black hole, is being formed. And as the infalling material is accreted onto that uh, newly formed compact object, it launches a jet, which is what we observe as the flash of gamma rays, as the GRV itself. And that is what we see. Nice artistic impression on the right hand side here. Um, just like to make it clear, we can never actually see this happen. Uh, this is just an artist impression. Um, and yeah, so it's this is like the signpost. When we see this flash of gamma rays, this is the signpost of a massive star ending its lifetime. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, because of how quickly these flashes of gamma rays happen and how rapidly variable the light curves that we see associated with them are, we think that this the flash or the prompt emission, as it's called in the center of this slide here, um, is it occurs due to internal jet processes. And what I mean by that is it sounds a bit ambiguous, um, but what I mean is it could be magnetic reconnection or it could be uh, shells and material um, hitting each other as the jet is being launched and uh, shocks are producing this very uh, this uh, high energy radiation that we then see. Um, but that's not the part I'm interested in. The part I'm interested in is the bit that comes after that. So we Swift or Fermi detects this flash and then we get all our telescopes to point at it afterwards and see what comes next. And basically what comes next is what we call the afterglow. And that is uh, that is produced as the jet collides with the circumburst environment, begins to decelerate, um, and as it's doing that, it shock accelerates electrons in the circumburst environment, which then cool and produce broadband synchrotron radiation. Um, now, this synchrotron radiation can be observed over orders of magnitude in frequency space, um, and actually, sometimes we don't just observe one synchrotron uh, spectrum, we can observe multiple um, components. And this is produced as uh, because there are separate uh, what we call external shocks going on here. So the prompt emission was as a result of internal processes within the jet, but the afterglow is from external processes. So we have this one shock front that's created as the jet collides into the circumburst environment. But as that the front of the shock, as it decelerates, material behind it that's still being launched from the black hole catches up and then basically bounce, reflects back towards the newly formed compact object and produces a second shock component. Um, this is called the reverse shock. Um, and I won't talk too much about that in my talk, but I will mention it briefly. So hence talking about it now. Um, so I've said the afterglow produces synchrotron radiation. So uh, what does that look like? Uh, so here's a very simple uh, uh, example, uh, synchrotron SED. Um, and as you can see, it's made up of uh, a load of power laws. Um, and they're connected together via three frequency breaks and normalized to some maximum flux density. Um, and those frequency breaks are the self-absorption frequency, 
and any radiation below emitted below that is self-absorbed. We have uh, the frequency that corresponds to the electrons with the lowest amount of energy. Uh, and then we have the cooling break. And any radiation uh, that's emitted above the cooling break comes from electrons that are radiating a significant fraction of their energy away over the characteristic lifetime of the jet. And then finally, we have some flux density that we're normalizing this to. Um, but the jet is not static. Okay, so this uh, example SED here, it would not stay like this if you carry on observing this. It's going to evolve with time. Um, and as a result, a light curve that if we were to look at uh, an afterglow for multiple epochs, we will see a varying light curve. And here is an example of one of those. Not everyone is going to look the same because there are different um, environments and processes going on within the jet that I'll talk about in the next slide. But I just want to show you how the both the uh, spectrum and the light curve can be well explained by a series of power laws. And actually, in some cases, we can observe these things compared to the prompt emission where it's only a couple of seconds that we're observing this radiation for. In terms of the afterglow, we can observe them for months or sometimes even years in the brightest of cases. Um, so once we've, we've got our synchrotron spectrum or we've got our light curves and we know we can pinpoint what the maximum flux density is of the afterglow and we can locate our three frequency breaks and we know how far away it is based on um, spectroscopic observations of the host galaxy, we can gain actually a lot of physical information about these systems. Um, so uh, on the left here, I have the observables. And on the right here, I have the physical parameters that we can extract. Um, so going from left to right, uh, so we can learn about the kinetic energy that's present within the jet. Uh, we can learn about the uh, spectral in or the index of the electron energy distribution so that's telling us about how uh, electrons are accelerated within the jet front uh, we can learn about the environment that these systems are in uh, so n slash a star refers to whether this is a homogeneous environment so say it's uh there's yeah there's no radial profile moving away from the the grb site or we have a stellar wind environment so that's what one would expect if we're seeing uh, a jet propagate through the uh, residual stellar wind from before uh, the core collapse happened. Um, and then here we have epsilon E and B. So these are called the microphysical parameters. So these basically characterize uh, the microphysics of what's happening in the jet. So we do this in terms of the fraction of energy, the kinetic energy in the jet that's given to the electrons, epsilon E, and the fraction of uh, the kinetic energy that's given to the magnetic field, epsilon B. And then finally, if we're able to observe these events for long enough, we can also gain some information about the geometry of these systems. So this can be uh, the opening angle of the jet. Um, and in some very lucky cases, maybe also the uh, our viewing angle to the jet as well. Um, but as these are highly relativistic systems, there's a lot of relativistic beaming going on. So that's very hard to infer. Um, but yeah, but maybe sometimes we can in interpret this. Um, so everything I've said so far is valid for all GLBs. So I've said I'm interested in long GLBs, but that is also valid for short GLBs, those that come from binary neutron star mergers. Um, but it's all been between the radio band and the X-ray band. That's like traditional afterglow physics. Um, but theory has, for about two decades now, said that there should be a an additional component, this very high energy component, um, and traditionally, this is thought to have come from synchrotron self-Compton radiation. So it's SSC on this uh, little uh, cartoony thing here. Um, and so what we've got here is flux versus energy. Um, and in yellow, we have the synchrotron component. So that's what I've mentioned already. But then as you go to higher energies, the flux of the afterglow should be expected to rise again um, as we have synchrotron self-Compton starting to dominate over the synchrotron. Now, synchrotron self-Compton radiation is produced when photons, uh, synchrotron photons within the jet are upscattered by the electrons that emitted those synchrotron photons in the first place, and they're uh, bump boosted up to much, much higher energies, so very high energies. Um, so, yeah, in theory, there should be a component at uh, GeV, hundreds of GeV, maybe TeV energies. Um, but up until 2018, no such counterpart had been detected. 
Um, now, we detect about 100 GRBs a year with SWIFT. Uh, so you'd think that it would be, we should have been detecting these counterparts for a while now. Um, certainly, it, I mean, based on how the theory works, it's actually quite simple. So why have we not been finding these uh, high, very high energy counterparts? Um, so there are two main reasons for this. The first is, um, apologies for my, actually, no, I really like this cartoon. I'm very proud of it. Um, so the first is basically how far away these events are happening. So I mentioned uh, right at the beginning that GRBs can be detected out of redshifts eight and nine. Um, and the average uh, redshift of a long gamma ray burst is redshift two. Okay, so that's really far away. Um, however, when we go to these very high energies, the universe is pretty opaque uh, to these photons. Um, so basically what is happening is a very high energy counterpart could be produced by the jet. And these photons propagate through the universe like the radio ones do, like the optical ones do. But then they interact with what we call the extragalactic background light. So these are ambient optical infrared photons that are produced by galactic processes. And these two, these different photons interact and pair produce such as that actually by the time these photons from these GRBs reach Earth, most of them have been absorbed and the resulting BHE flux is heavily attenuated. Now, this is not a step function. Um, so, but by the time you get to higher and higher redshift, so if you, by the time you get to redshift about 1.5, which is actually for GRBs pretty low redshift, um, there is no way that you are going to be able to see a very high energy counterpart from a gamma ray burst. So basically, we can only even try to begin to detect these counterparts from low redshift gamma ray bursts, um, which are obviously a lot rarer because you're probing a much smaller volume of space. Now, the second reason is the telescopes uh, that we use. Uh, so here is one of my holiday snaps from when I was in my undergrad. Uh, standing in front of the magic uh, telescope in La Palma. Uh, so this is a Cherenkov uh, telescope. So it's a pointed telescope that we use to detect the Cherenkov light produced when very high energy photons hit the Earth atmosphere and cause uh, these showers. Um, the, but the problem is the Cherenkov radiation that's produced as a result of the very high energy photons hitting the Earth's atmosphere, that it's very, very faint light. So basically you can't have any strong sources of background light, okay? So you can't observe during the day, definitely can't. The sun is way too bright and it's basically, it just saturates the photomultiplier tubes. And you also can't observe when the moon is particularly bright. So that is taking out about, 60% of your potential observing time. Um, and so we are having to, the way in the best way to go about observing then with these VHE, uh, with these Cherenkov telescopes is to observe, go after as many uh, gamma ray bursts as possible, but most of them are gonna be too far away. You can't wait to find out if we know what the redshift is to then observe because that synchrotron self Compton component that I showed you here is only gonna be visible at the very earliest times. Like the rest of the afterglow, it's gonna fade with time and it's gonna fade probably within minutes, maybe hours if we're lucky. So we really, it's kind of a numbers game at this point, uh, which I think quite clearly explains why it took until four years ago to begin detecting uh, very high energy counterparts to gamma ray bursts. Um, so now we have detected, as of two weeks ago, we have now detected six very high energy counterparts uh, to long gamma ray bursts. And as I think is always expected, the observations did not fit with the theory quite as well as we expected. Um, so I said that the theory dictates that we should be having synchrotron self competent radiation um, to explain the very high energy counterpart. So what I've shown here is we have two SEDs for two separate VHE GRBs. So on the bottom left, we have the X-ray to very high energy SED from GRB 1901-14C. So this was the first publicly known about very high energy gamma ray burst. Um, so in the gamma ray burst community, we use 
um, this system called the GCN, uh, which is the gamma ray burst coordinate network. So this was the first time that MAGIC or HESS had to use this system to immediately notify the community about these this event. Um, and the data that's shown here for this event can be explained with synchrotron cell Compton. However, if we look at the top right hand plot, we have the SED that actually goes to optical in this case. Those are the purple data points. The optical to very high energy counterpart for this event can only be explained with synchrotron radiation. So that means we are observing a single synchrotron spectrum from radio all the way up to very high energies, which is 18 orders of magnitude in frequency space, uh, which is slightly nuts if you ask me and just not really possible for many reasons and I can if you want I can ask say at the end um, and yeah so already we have six events and at least two scenarios of what could be going on here um, so we really need to understand the rest of the afterglow a lot better in order to really know what's going on with the very high energies because only in understanding the rest of the afterglow can we then really rule out what's going on at the high energies or or include the correct theories um yeah so uh everything these very high energies are, uh we're looking at what one tev okay uh but i as uh, john very nicely introduced me at the beginning um i am a radio expert so i study things that are 18 orders of magnitude away in frequency space why how is there a connection here uh but actually, using the radio band to study these events is probably one of the best bands. Um, I'm not biased at all. Um, but it's great because if you remember that synchrotron spectrum I showed you earlier on, the peak of the synchrotron spectrum is in the radio band for a really, really long time. And it means that we're able to, as the synchrotron spectrum evolves, it means we're able to observe uh the radio afterglow for much longer than we can in any other band. In optical and x-rays, we expect to be able to detect the afterglow for days, maybe weeks, but comparatively in the radio band, we can detect it for months or years. So really it's kind of a no brainer that you want to really, really understand what's going on in the radio band for these sources. And as a result of being able to observe these systems for so long in the radio, it means that you have the opportunity to observe or at least constrain the location of multiple frequency breaks as they move through the band. And this means that by observing multiple frequency breaks and really understanding how the synchrotron spectrum evolves, we can gain as much information about these systems as possible. We can learn about how uh, what the environment is like that these things are propagating through. And we can learn about those microphysical parameters that have historically just been assumed to be certain numbers or marginalized over. Um, and I think with uh, the VHE GLBs, this has really come into its own in understanding the radio counterparts because we have obtained strong detections for long periods of time for all six VHE GLBs, and that has really enabled us to constrain the synchrotron spectrum in a way that usually isn't possible. Um, yeah, one sec. So I'm gonna talk now, so that's like the introduction part, that's like why this work is really cool, why it's really interesting. Um, so now I'm gonna talk briefly about two different um, VHE GLBs that I've worked on. Um, and I think these events are also interesting in themselves because it shows how varied the data is from these events. Um, so it's great to have all this theory and what we think is going on. When it comes down to it, um, GRB data is not always fantastic. It, it can be patchy uh, and it makes it very hard to interpret what's going on. Uh, so the first case, uh, this GRB 1909A, that is like, the poster child for GLB afterglows. We have amazing data and it's beautiful. Um, but then the, uh, the next one I show you, 2012-16C, you will see it's a very, very different picture where we're really having to like tease every single tiny bit of data apart to understand what's going on. Um, and the picture isn't as obvious straight away. Um, so GLB 1908-29A was the third closest gamma ray burst ever to be detected. So this was like the perfect opportunity to find a VHE counterpart. Um, and as a result, uh, the v uh, HESS uh, in Namibia was able to detect a counterpart for 54 hours post-burst. So that's days rather than minutes or hours as to what we usually expect. 
Um, and because it was so nearby, it provided a really good opportunity to observe this event with as many telescopes we could get our hands on for as long as possible. And that's what we did. Um, so here is uh, the data that we collected for GRB 1908-29A. Um, so don't worry, I will go through this. Um, so what we've got here is the light curves for about 200 days with two different radio telescopes. So in gray, we have the Amy, the light curve from the Amy telescope. That is an eight dish interferometer in Cambridge in the UK. Um, and you'll see it's a broken power law and then followed by this like plateau component thing at the end. Um, and because the light curve is constantly decaying, we can conclude that this is coming from a reverse shock. So these aren't often seen uh, in gamma ray burst afterglows, even though I mentioned at the beginning, this is this shock that propagates back towards the circumburst environment. The actually, when it comes down to it, these aren't often seen. So the fact that we were able to see this in the first place is great. And because it connects well to some of the physics in the synchrotron self-Compton uh, emission uh, processes. But then what's this, there's this weird plateau component. That's not what we expect from gamma ray burst afterglows. Um, but then when we compare it to the um, meerkat like data that we had, it became a lot clearer. So what we thought was that maybe actually, because Amy doesn't have fantastic angular resolution, maybe we've resolved in some host galaxy radiation. That could seem very feasible. Um, and so, we compared our Amy images to the Meerkat images, which has is a telescope with much higher angular resolution, um, as shown here. So Amy is the color map on the back, and Meerkat is the contours in the front. Um, and if you look at source B that I'm highlighting, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but yeah, uh, source B, that is the host galaxy component. A is the gamma ray burst. Um, but yeah, B, we're seeing host galaxy. So and as you can see, it's both firmly within this bright uh, Amy source that we're observing. So it makes sense that actually with Amy, we were also seeing the host galaxy. But what about the meerkat light curve itself? It's great. We saw the host galaxy. Yeah. But we actually care about the GRB. Um, so the GR, the afterglow with Amy uh, meerkat could also be really well explained uh, with a broken power law, like for the reverse shock. But because of the different not only the different decay rates of the two uh, light curves here and here, um, and the fact that we're seeing a rise early on with uh, Meerkat, this tells us this is a forward shock. Um, and because we're able to see, we literally saw the pink of, peak of the synchrotron spectrum move through the Meerkat band, as we were observing at around like 15 days, we were able to constrain the kinetic energy that's present in the jet and the environment through which that jet was propagating through. Um, and that showed us that this was actually, we were very lucky to be able to detect this burst because not only was it a low, den very, very low density ISM event, so about 10 to the minus six particles per centimeter cubed, which is like, uh, corona like hot coronal gas kind of densities. This is also a very low kinetic energy event. Um, and yes, yeah, so, the resulting luminosity from this event that we were observing as a result of this interaction between the low kinetic energy shock front and the low density ISM meant that this was very, very low luminosity and we were just very lucky to observe. If you put this at much higher redshift, there was just no way we were ever going to see it. And yeah, so that was oh, beautiful light curves. We love it. It's great. But it's not very uh, representative of GRB data sets on the whole. Um, so that brings me to GLB 2012-16C. Um, so firstly, this was at a much higher redshift. So I said that 1908-29A was at uh, a redshift of about 0 0.08. This is at redshift of 1.1. So we're really on the top end of where we can even expect to detect um, very high energy counterparts at this point. Um, I think actually a lot of the theory community was quite surprised to detect uh, photons at hundreds of GeV from this event. Um, another interesting uh, point about uh, maybe a contributor, probably a very large contributing factor to the reason that uh, we don't have such fantastic data for this uh, GLB is you notice that the naming conventions for these events 
Um, so 2012 16 C is the date that um, this event happened. So it was the 16th of December 2020. Um, and I know the last few years have been a bit of a blur, but this was like the first six months of the pandemic. Uh, it was also, oh, first nine months of the pandemic. It was also about a week before Christmas. And so that meant that a large portion of the world was already on holiday. And so obtaining telescope time when you don't already have uh, accepted proposals. So this means we ask for telescope time through something called director's discretionary time. It's very hard to get that telescope time or at least to get prompt replies. Um, and yeah, so it was a very uh, interesting uh, way of collecting data for me. And uh, yeah, I certainly learned a lot about writing very fast proposals during this process. However, we did get data. And for this event, I wasn't just looking at the radio counterpart. We we're really looking at the optical and the x-rays as well. Um, and as a result of looking at all that, I like to call this burst the burst that does everything because it literally did. Um, and yeah, so I will show you now the data for this event. So if you remember 1908-29A, beautiful light curves. It was very obvious what's going on. Here, we quite literally have about 12 data points. And you have to create, we have to use this data in the same way that I use the data for 1908-29A to create this picture of what we're observing here. What shot components are we observing? Um, and with much fewer data points, this is very hard to do. But I will try and take you through what the how we did it. Um, and hopefully you'll believe me. Um, and yeah, so to start with, let's go from left to right. Okay, so firstly, we have in the squares, we have the optical data points. So because uh, this is also very far away, close to Christmas, blah, 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 COVID, a lot of telescope uh, facilities weren't running. Um, and it means that we don't ha even have as much optical data. Um, a lot of optical facilities are robotic. So that means they just point and shoot. Um, but but at the risk of them breaking, a lot of them were just closed down for the duration of the pandemic. So we didn't have that opportunity. Um, and then in the black data points, we have Swift XRT. Um, so the first thing I want to point out to you guys is how similar the flux densities are at around 0.1 days at optical and X-ray energies. Um, and this is shown better here. So uh, it's a bit of an odd plot, I guess. But using the, so with the X-ray data point uh, over here on the right-hand side, we can extract informa spectral information. We just don't, we don't just have a flux density. We have a flux density and a spectral index. So we can predict from that spectral information what we expect the optical flux density to be. Um, and that is shown by this like ice cream cone, blue ice cream cone thing. Um, but then the black square is the optical flux density that we measured. And it's not in the cone. So what's going on here? Basically, a lot of the optical radiation that was emitted from the shock front uh, by the GRB was absorbed by dust in the vicinity of the GRB site. Um, and so this we call this a dark GRB. So this is when either the optical radiation is heavily attenuated or it's just missing altogether because we can't detect it. Um, and this is really interesting uh, to detect, still detect radiation from a dark GLB because it tells us that um, when we compare this to spectroscopic observations of host galaxies that show that uh, dust is not uniformly distributed in host galaxies, but rather is patchy, it shows us that the, the, the star that was the progenitor for the GLB, it didn't really move that far before it uh, it reached the end of its main sequence lifetime. Um, these The main sequence lifetimes for these stars are so short that they're basically just in their birth site still, which is, oh, pardon me, sorry, which is really interesting. Um, and this is also one of the most heavily attenuated uh, optical uh, detections that we've got. So by that, I mean like the difference between the detected afterglow and what we expect it should be, that is the largest difference one of the largest differences for a GLB where we still detected after our optical radiation. So this still means we can do a lot with this system. Now, the second thing that uh, decided to get in the way of uh, the GLB photons was our own host galaxy. Um, so in the radio, uh, 
it, we see it a lot with pulsars. We see effects of scintillation. So this is um, free electrons in the Milky Way uh, cause refraction or diffraction of uh, radio waves as they propagate through the uh, Milky Way. And it basically results in seemingly random flux density fluctuations um, and also spectral index fluctuations, which mean that in some cases we just cannot trust uh, the measurements that we're making with our radio telescopes. Um, it's very annoying. However, if we're lucky, we can still do something with this information. Um, so the best analogy that exists to this is when you go outside and you look at the night sky, stars twinkle and planets don't. And that's because projected on the night sky, planets are a lot larger. So they don't, they are not affected by scintillation in the way that point sources, i.e. stars are. And so we can use this analogy and apply it to GLBs. So gamma ray bursts projected onto the night sky are very, very tiny objects. They are point sources, but they grow as the jet evolves, the size it's still, we can't, we'll never be able to see it, but the projected size of the GLB on the night sky will grow. And as it grows, the effects of scintillation decrease and cease. And this means that as they do this, we can measure, we can place inferences on the size of the gamma ray burst on the night sky. And this is very rarely done because usually we don't have good enough data. So there are only about five gamma ray bursts for which we have radio size constraints, uh, which is really important in actually understanding how the size of these systems evolve. But it does also mean that we then can't use the data in our afterglow modeling. So our E Merlin data, um, so the green crosses here, we couldn't actually use them in terms of the actual afterglow modeling, but we could still use them in some ways. Um, so actually what was going on here? Um, so I've got those lines and stuff on this data, uh, this plot now, but the most important thing to take away is, is that the flux densities of all the data points that we measure here are within about two orders of magnitude from each other. And this is quite odd and interesting because if you think about the synchrotron spectrum from the forward shot. Okay, this is the only thing I forgot to mention that before. This is the only thing we care about for this system. That's when we're trying to model these events, we say forward shot goes first, and then anything else that doesn't fit, we work about that afterwards. So we have our forward shock, and it's evolving from, say, the peak is in the optical early times, and then it evolves down to radio. And depending on the environment through which the jet is propagating through, the peak flux density, we either expect it to stay the same at all times or we expect it to decrease. And the fact that these, uh, we can actually use this information by the fact that the flux density is approximately the same at all times. Remember these optical data points are much lower than they should be. We're discovering that this means that this jet is propagating through a stellar wind-like environment. Um, so we can actually use this to tell us something about the mass loss rate of the host star, and then also information about what the mass was of the progenitor system. Um, but even still, even though we have only 12 or 20 data points for the system, we actually couldn't fit the entire thing with a single shock model. Um, the late time meerkat data points, which are in purple here, they just don't really fit. They're changing too quickly. The spectral indices don't work out. So actually what we assume is going on here is that our early radio and X-ray and optical data points, they all come from a narrow jet that's pointing towards us. That is what we usually see for a gamma ray burst. But then the later time radiation is coming from what we call a cocoon. Now this is shown better in my nice schematic here. Um, and cocoons are to be expected from gamma ray bursts. As the jet is still propagating through that infalling material uh, before we even see the GRB, so the jet has literally just been launched. We, the jet is propagating through infalling material and dumping energy into that surrounding material, which then recolumates it. But it means that that energy, that material around it, now has more energy and so starts to move outwards as well. But it it has less energy than the GRB jet itself, so is moving at a much slower velocity and has much lower energy. So we don't aren't always expecting to see this component just because it's not going to be as luminous as the main jet. Uh, so we're only going to see it in very uh, fortunate circumstances like we did here. We got late enough observations. 
uh, the geometry was such that we were able to observe it. But this was really interesting because it fit well with what one would expect to see, though we just don't always see it. Um, and I think this really shows how important late time observations are in these in GRB systems, because often we get to a point where the radio, the afterglow just begins to drop off. It follows a power law and we just give up. We just stop observing because we're like, we know what's going to happen. But actually, we should carry on observing into late times because we could see these additional emission components that we wouldn't have otherwise found. So the last thing I want to talk to you about, oh, I have time, it's all good, um, is uh, population studies. So with six, or oh, sort of six, very high energy gamma ray bursts to date, we can start to consider that to be a population. Um, and... The idea behind this is determining whether the HEGRBs are intrinsically different to the rest of the gamma ray burst population, or is it that simply the very high energy component has a luminosity function such that sometimes we detect it and sometimes we don't? And actually, do all gamma ray bursts produce very high energy components? So I've done, um, this is like sort of, very old work and new work. Um, so the first way I thought to think about this is the simplest way of doing it really. Um, so we have all these great radio light curves um, and we know how far away they are. So are the luminosities of these systems uh, different to very high energy uh, to the rest of the GLB population? Um, because if there is just a simple luminosity function uh, for the very high energy counterpart, and we expect it to scale uh, at radio frequencies as well, maybe we can tell something from the radio luminosities. So what I've done here is in blue, we have the single band radio light curves in luminosity space for all well, five of the VHE GLBs. I haven't put the latest one on here. Um, and then the gray are a sensitivity limited sample of GLB light curves from other long gamma ray bursts that either don't have BHE detections or observations. And as you can see, perhaps with the exception of 1908-29A, these two are pretty consistent with each other. Um, and as I've already mentioned, 1908-29A was very low luminosity and we only detected it because it was nearby. But if we want to go into more detail than this, another way to do it is potentially look at the environment in which these things are happening. Um, so I've said that, uh, GRB 2012-16C was a dark gamma ray burst, um, but I said it also had a stellar wind environment. So when we look at the environments, the immediate environments of the GRBs, the VHE GRB population, they're all very, very different. So in 1908-29A, we had this really low density homogeneous environment, and 2012-16C, we had a high density stellar wind. So very, very different. However, it's beginning to look like the VHE GRB population are residing in regions of their host galaxies that are, have more dust. So when we look at the long gamma ray burst population as a whole, about 25 to 40% of the population can be considered dark. Their optical radiation is lower than what one would expect from the X-rays. However, on this plot, I've put in the GRBs uh, that have VHE detections, I've put them in with the pink stars, and you can see in this region of parameter space, this is the dark GLB region, um, we have three of six, uh, three of five VHE GLBs. Um, but actually, it's not just these three. GLB 2010-15A also shows evidence of dust in its spectra. And this is showing us that 80%, I know it's small number statistics, but 80% of these VHE GLBs have got a lot of dust. Whereas this is a much higher fraction than we would usually observe. And it's not that we are observing these systems better. It, the inference of dust is actually a very simple inference to make. So is this a possible connection? So I mentioned at the start that synchrotron and synchrotron self-Compton radiation are the two prevailing theories as to why um, VHE emission occurs, but there's a third option, and this is external inverse Compton. So instead of the synchrotron photons being the source of the photon source for upscattering by the synchrotron electrons, here we have some external photon field uh, where the photons are incident onto the jet, 
the synchrotron electrons, they upscatter those photons up to very high energies. So at the moment, I'm working on a toy model that we can use to see if you had some dust ring that surrounds the GRB site. Is, is it reasonable to expect that that photon field could be strong enough such that you could produce very high energy photons? And yeah, so that's a really interesting line of work, but it's still very preliminary and I have other things to do at the moment. So it's kind of a bit slow, um, but it's looking very promising. Um, and it's really exciting because it's just not really been considered by many people. Um, I think it was kind of just ignored quite early on. So we're like, oh no, let's go for the simplest case. But the, uh, the synchrotron afterglows from these events are showing us that there is all this dust going on here. Can this contribute? Um, and yeah, so I think this will hopefully sometime soon, I'll have time to write a paper on it. Um, and yeah, so it'd be really interesting to see what the theory community think and what the very high energy community think as well. Um, and yeah, so to conclude on everything I've said so far, um, I think I like to think I've convinced you guys that these are very, very interesting uh, transients. Um, it's kind of reignited everyone's like imagination and um, like, I think for a while people thought the long GRB field had got a bit boring. Um, especially after GW170817, everyone was like, oh yeah, binary neutron star mergers, they're the, they're the hot topic. Um, but these long gamma ray bursts have enabled us to really test the afterglow models in ways that we haven't previously done because, because it's like, oh, new and exciting. Everyone wants to get telescope time on these events and everyone wants to be looking at them. So we're gathering data sets that just are completely unparalleled. Um, and when we then look at how we interpret those observations, we're seeing that BHE GRBs is just as varied as the rest of the population when we go from a case to case basis. But there are starting to be some trends emerging that are saying, oh, actually, maybe there, but like very, very, I want to say this very, very preliminary, maybe there could be a separate population. Maybe there is some preference preference of these GRBs having a particular microphysics or a particular environment. Um, and yeah, and as promised in my uh, introduction thingy, uh, abstract, my last slide before questions is um, on this newest VHE GRB. Um, so this is a very self-perpetuating um, event. It's been on the news. Um, it's everyone's very excited about it, and it is very exciting. Um, so GRB 2010-09A is the most recent very high energy gamma ray burst. At a redshift of 0.151, it's not the most distant, nor is it the most the closest very high energy gamma ray burst to date. However, what's interesting about it is this is the first GRB where we are actually breaching the one TeV limit. So up until now, we said very high energy gamma ray burst because we've only been at, I say only, we've been at hundreds of GeV, but now we are firmly in the TeV regime. And this is the first time for which we've detected this. Um, it is the brightest GRB to date that we've ever detected. It was so bright and also its coincident location with the galactic plane is that initially we thought that this was a galactic transient. It was mimicking X-ray binaries such as uh, Maxi J1820 and its behavior. And so initially we just kind of ignored it. Um, or we, yeah, we just were like, oh, it's an X-ray binary, oh, who cares? But it became clear pretty quickly that uh, when Fermi published its detection that this was a very special event. Um, so for me, in terms of the radio, this is the brightest radio counterpart for any GRB to date. At It's peaked um, at around 40 millijanskis, uh, which is just absurdly bright. Um, yeah, we I've never seen anything like this before. Um, and it means that we're able to gain a lot of spectral and temporal information on short timescales. Um, and even though it's we're having to look through the galactic plane to see this object, because that means we have a lot of attenuation due to dust within our own host galaxy, which is affecting the optical observations. Because it is so bright, we are still able to uh, trace the optical afterglow. We've been able to see uh, in the last few days the rise of the supernova due, through both photo photometry and the spectroscopy. Um, and in the ray, in the X-ray, um, the X-ray counterpart, which is shown here on the bottom right, um, this is actually the first time that BAT 
has detected the afterglow. So Swift Bat is it's the burst alert telescope on uh, Swift, and it usually detects the flash of gamma rays itself. But when we looked at the Fermi detection time and the Swift detection time, there was an hour difference between the two, where Bat's detection time was a lot later. So when we went and looked at uh, the data for the system, this first like blue swarm of data points, this is not what we would expect the prompt emission, the GRB itself to look like. We expect a very short, rapidly varying event. This is very smooth and fits with the rest of the afterglow to be a really nice power law. So even for BAT, after a long time, like a really long time of observing, it is still like absolutely baffling us that this it's able to detect the afterglow in the brightest cases. And it meant that we were able to really see the full evolution of the X-ray afterglow. Um, and as you can see down here at later time, so we're on for a couple of billion seconds, a couple of million seconds even now, um, we're really, we have this perfect power law and this is gonna be really great in order to like pinpoint the lower end of the synchrotron spectrum for this, from which we should be then be able to really understand what's going on with the very high energy component. Um, and then I will leave you with this future uh, slide. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening to my talk. And if anyone has any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lawrence. I will uh, just uh, start for everyone. Uh, are there any questions uh, for our speaker? Please either speak up or raise your hand or use the the, the chat. Yeah, one sec, I'll move. Uh, Amanda, please go ahead. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, could we go back one slide again? Uh, or this the, one. The, this one, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm i sure you said it and I just didn't catch it. What's the difference between the blue and the red on the flux and photon in, index plot there? So um, this is the way in which SWIFT uh, detects uh, radiation. So it has two like modes. So it has what we call window timing mode and photon counting mode. Um, so as the GRB gets, well, as the afterglow gets fainter, we switch to photon counting um, uh and it, yeah, it just makes it easier to still see the thing. Does that make sense? I, it makes perfect sense. I, I I suspected it was something like that, but I wasn't sure. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, so I also have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So what uh, type of supernova is associated with this event? Um, I don't actually know at the moment. Um, so there are GC GCNs on this. Um, I am imagine I I like to think it would be a type one BC broadline type supernova. Um, but I can check that for you and get back to you. Um, and yeah, the problem is the GCN author lists are getting longer and longer. And I just see the title and I'm like, oh, do I need to read this or not? And then I just move on because I have to scroll for ages to see. Um, but I do know that there get there are James Webb has looked at this, um, so hopefully that will really help with um, understanding the supernova a bit more because then we don't have to worry so much about dust. Yeah, I know also that Pan Stars has been observing daily. Um, so Stephen Smart, who's the one of the PIs, he's just moved here, um, and so we've been chatting a lot about this, and there will definitely. There's really, really good coverage of the supernova for this source. Oh, nice. So uh, any idea how bright it, uh, it is currently? It is something like 21st, 22nd magnitude. Right. It is so not, not, not that bright. Yeah. No, okay. unfortunately not. Um, but that's the dust's fault, not the supernova's fault. Understood. Uh... Do you happen to remember on this subject how long the TEV emission lasted? Um, so the problem with this event was that the moon was, is, there was a full moon on the first night. Um, so pointed telescopes like Hess and Magic, the ones that I showed earlier, they uh, weren't able, so they weren't able to look straight away. Though I think they have since tried, but they haven't published their results. 
Um, so I'm not really sure. But Lahaso, they were the ones, that's the detection that I personally trust. I, carpets detection, I don't think should be believed too, uh, too much. Um, but I mean, I think it's like a couple of hours at least. Um, because it's so luminous, I wouldn't be surprised if we were getting similar results to with 1908-29A. Um, I think, I don't think that would be totally unreasonable to expect a paper from Hess in the next few months or so with that result. Unfortunately, Magic didn't have anyone on La Palma to observe because of the moon. So I think it's only Hess that is the best facility to observe this source. I'm well, uh, I believe Veritas looked as well, but um, oh, cool, it's challenging. And I, I, and it was after the fact, um, from what I seem to recall, we, we had to look at it with UV filters, which makes it dicey because mm -hmm. of the bright moonlight. Um, and that raises your threshold quite a bit, but at one yeah. TV, if it were still there, you would have expected to maybe see something. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what we do or don't see, but it wasn't too exciting. Oh, no, um, that's fair. <laughs> uh, and as I said, it's it's difficult data to interpret. We don't do a lot of UV filter observations. Um, we usually observe with the camera unfiltered. Okay. Uh, but but it, this is very interesting to to see the whole picture. It, it's, it's and I was wondering what you. Know, whether you had a good picture of, of how long the, the bright emission in the TEV lasted, but it, it seems very patchy in terms of what we know. Um, yeah. Carry on. So, yeah. Uh, if it, I'll, I'll defer if other people have questions. I have a question about the, the dust mm -hmm. discussion again, um, it, but I can wait if other people have questions they'd like to ask. Um, in that case, to change topics a little bit, this this population study, this idea that there's dust around most of these VHE bright gamma ray bursts, I didn't fully understand the theoretical implications of your argument when you said you have dust around these objects, and that would actually that there might be a mechanism whereby that would promote the gamma ray emission. That was a little bit opaque to me, so I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, what the mechanism is. Yeah, of course. So um, because these gamma ray bursts are occurring in particularly dusty environments, as we've understood from these observations, the idea is that, um, so uh, the dust produces infrared radiation reprocessed from um, either starlight or from the gamma ray burst optical radiation itself. So the dust is producing infrared emission, which is then incident onto the jet. And via inverse Compton, we then upscatter those infrared photons up to very high energies. Um, and that would produce the very high energy component. Now, in order to do this, it's one dust. It's it it's that's where you're getting the the, the large number of infrared photons. Yeah. Um, and it's not completely ridiculous. This is possible. So the elect so the important part here is what electron Lorentz factors you're getting, because that will determine how high energy you can scatter up to. And I mean, the electron Lorentz factors we need are very reasonable. Um, they're of the order of uh, a few million um and this is also this has been seen in uh x-ray binaries which are far less energetic and have far lower lorentz factors um a bulk lorentz factor sorry not electron lorentz factors um so it doesn't seem completely insane that it could be possible it could have some contributing uh factor um but yeah it's still very much work in progress I, I, my other question is just, I mean, these events were very relatively violent, but you indicated that there are dust indicators in the spectrum of the afterglow itself, not just prior observations in that region. Um, do you, for any of these objects, is there a sense of how the dust distribution may have changed after the GRB itself? I mean, how how undisturbed does this dust stay, or um, does the dustiness of the environment change significantly after the GRB? So we have observations where we see evidence of dust destruction. So it is definitely like 
that you're right is incredibly violent and it's not that it's remains unperturbed um but because of how far away a lot of these events are it's hard to get those late time observations that would tell us what the environment was like afterwards um but i'm hoping to start working with the people who have these spectroscopic observations that would tell us a bit more about how the dust is how the environment is changing and what exactly is going on with the dust there because at the moment when we do the maths it's basically we assume that um out to some termination shock radius it's just stellar wind and then beyond that we have like the giant molecular clouds and all the dust and everything and that is what is producing these infrared photons but obviously this is a toy model um and it's not obviously it's not perfect so it'd be better have it would be nice to have a better idea of really what is going on because i mean historically also i'm not an optical per uh, like a optical spectroscopy person does that help yeah. No, that, that that does help. And and you've answered my question, which is if you are you are considering that that could affect your numbers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's definitely a dust destruction that you can calculate a dust destruction radius given the luminosity and um, there's something else as well as I've forgotten. Um, and then so anything inside that you wouldn't be able to consider anyway in your in your calculations. But beyond that, it should be reasonable to be able to say, OK, outside this many parsecs, you can consider the dust radiation. Interesting, thank you. That's okay. All right, so any final question for our speaker? Uh, point three, point two, uh, point one. Okay, so if not, so, uh, Lauren, uh, thanks again uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, talk. And uh, let's do that again in person uh, next yes. time. Yeah, hopefully I'll be about okay. in May. That would be nice to come visit you guys. Looking forward. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. And uh, see you next uh, week. So, bye. Thank you, John. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.